Hello everyone, this is Kat. Welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the seventh and final part to Paper Agency. One of the good things about the way Watchmen worked was that a lot of his preliminary investigative legwork was through drone cams and security footage that was shared. It was a holdover from when he'd had to juggle his investigations while earning additional income, but it did mean that Izuku had the infrastructure in place so that he could work from the couch while Aizawa dragged Toshi out on a mysterious errand. They didn't go far. Mike and Aizawa's neighborhood was one of the nicer areas in Musutafu, and a nice place to walk. Easy to access UA, convenient to the big district transit center, and major hero presence, and a lot of interesting green spaces. It was a shame the rent here was so far out of their price range, it was laughable, honestly. In the past few days of staying over with his teachers, guardians, parents, with Mike and Aizawa, had taught him anything, it was that he was definitely wanting to be nearby. He just also wanted to get laid again some day. Even if by some miracle Izu could handle the idea of having sex under the same roof as Eraserhead and present Mike, Hitoshi was all too aware that Mike's hyper-advanced hearing aids let him hear a fly fart on a roof next door. Privacy did not exist in the Yamada Aizawa household. It wasn't even an illusion. There was also the issue of the cats. Mike and Aizawa were between pets, their twin senior rescue cats, me and Mao, had died a little before the beginning of the year, within a few days of each other. It hadn't come as a surprise. They'd both been about 20 years old with health problems, but it had been sad. Mike was counting down the days before Aizawa came home with a stray kitten, but the main problem for Itoji was that Aizawa was as good with felines as he was bad with humans. They gravitated towards him. He didn't even have to do anything. It was massively unfair, and Itoji wasn't going to risk bringing home a cat only to have Aizawa immediately take all his affections. Izuku had been right in one way. Hitoshi did want to have an easy access to his found family. Izu was part of that, though. Hitoshi liked being able to share meals whenever everyone was in the house at the same time, or just hang out, and that'd be harder if he and Izu had to come in from the other side of town. So far, though, it looked like they were just going to have to make that work. Aizawa stopped them on the sidewalk, halfway down a quiet residential street, Hitoshi waited for a moment for him to say something, but Aizawa just turned his gaze upward and refused to say anything. It occurred to him after a few minutes that they had stopped in front of a house with a for-sale sign in the postage-stamp-sized yard. It was a nice place and all, clean and modern, with a tall stone privacy fence, and the sign advertised it as a 3LDK, where one of the extra rooms was a traditional tatami room. He kind of doubted that Aizawa meant for him to buy it. According to the sign, this house had already been sold, for one. Was it going up for rent, maybe? Even if it was, Itoshi doubted that they could scrape together all the deposits, fees, and insurance it would take to move into a place like that. What are we doing here? Hitoshi asked eventually. Aizawa sighed and dug into his pocket. He emerged with a key. Yagi's retiring. He's moving into the Hero Alliance Tower as an advisor or something. I bought this place off him pretty cheap. It's already got biometric security installed in a costume vault under the floors in one of the extra rooms. Hisashi's been after me to pick out some income properties. We're not getting any younger, and I've already had two major injuries in the past few years. He said, still not looking at Itoshi. No idea what it looks like inside. Knowing Yagi, it'll be covered in its own face. Izuku might not mind that, though. I'll rent it to you, if you want it. Might as well get tenants I like. Hitoshi's voice got stuck in his throat, and he couldn't help but stare at his mentor and his father figure. Aizawa held up under it for half a minute before he cracked. If it were me, just me, I'd have asked you to stay in the house with us. There's room and the company is great. It was both eerie and flattering to hear Aizawa describe anything except sleep as great. Only Hizashi never met a closed door that he didn't want to open, and I know you two are probably doing... things. He grimaced at the thought. It's only a matter of time before he walks in on something and gets traumatized. This is the best compromise I could think of. You boys start out with good security before Watchtower starts making the kind of enemies who try to follow you home. Hizashi gets off my back about passive income. We're all a short walk away so we can keep seeing one another, and Hizashi has another closet to sneak clothes into. The last bit got a laugh out of Itoshi. Yeah, he rubbed the back of his neck to distract himself, and the warm feelings in his chest... Okay, let's take a look. If it's awful, I warned you. Aizawa just sighed. It was not awful. The floors were dark, shiny hardwood, and the walls were newly painted. 
in all matte white paint. All Might had left behind the window treatments, cordless Roman shades made out of cream-colored tweed. Two of the three extra rooms in the three LDK were bedrooms on the second floor. The master bedroom was situated toward the back, and the windows were screened in by the branches of a tall white birch tree, providing privacy and a little natural light. The bathrooms were a state-of-the-art masterpiece, and also an uncomfortable insight into how All Might had to manage to culminate his health issues. Hitoshi could see evidence of where someone had installed a bath chair, a lift for one. They'd probably keep all the handrails and stuff, to be honest. One of them was likely to get hurt before too long. It was the reality that every hero and pro athlete had to live with. Injury and home recovery were inevitable. Hang on, I need to get Izu in on this. Hitoshi pulled out his phone to share his location. Yes, he demanded that he had right of choice on their new place, but that didn't mean that Izuka's opinions were totally irrelevant. They investigated the balcony in the backyard while they waited for Izuku to finally catch up. The privacy wall continued around the back, and there were some smaller, bushier trees along the rear section that framed an ornamental pond. It was dry at the moment, but Hitoshi was already planting fish and water lilies in the back of his mind. He and Aizawa were examining the storage shed, which was big enough for tools and a couple of bikes, very exciting, which Hitoshi had heard someone then coming onto the yard from the house. He started to call out for Izuku to come look, but realized very quickly that it was not his boyfriend that was joining them just yet. Sorry to interrupt. All Might was wearing his large form. He was down to about twenty minutes a day after the Kamino Ward incident, which had been both a blessing and a curse in ways. The nation knew what had become of the former number one, but it also made it so that All Might didn't have to put up a front anymore. I got an alert when you two went inside, and I realized I hadn't taken myself off the security system. You better not have jumped here, Aizawa warned, although it was pretty obvious that he had. I was on campus, and I still do need the exercise. All Might waved him off. It's good to see you again, young Shinso. How's the job hunt going? Have you accepted any offers? Hitoshi didn't have to lie or embroider his answer. I signed with Watchtower. It's been rewarding so far. Ah, I've heard good things about them. All Might sighed wistfully. It's good to see young heroes taking on the parts of town that get neglected by the bigger agencies. Red Tower's a unique character, but he's a good man to learn from. That was the first Hitoshi had heard of Tower knowing All Might. Thank you, sir. I'm working with Watchmen, though. Tower heads up the patrolling branch of the agency. I'm in intelligence and recon. Watchmen, you say? All Might looked a bit more impressed. I've heard even better things about him, but we've never actually crossed paths. He's worked with some of my old friends, and they like and respect him. They're not easily impressed of a group of people, either. Izu was going to lose his mind. Hitoshi had thought that he'd go nuts over the idea of living in All Might's old house, but meeting the man in person, hearing All Might's opinions of his work, his boyfriend might just, well, die on the spot. I think that he'd be very flattered to hear that, sir, Hitoshi said with complete honesty. Huh, you think so? All Might chuckled, and he rubbed the back of his head. He stilled and cocked his head. Were you two expecting anyone else? he asked. My boyfriend. Hitoshi gauged All Might's expression. He was an American, and they were weird about gay people sometimes, even though the United States had been one of the early adopters when it came to marriage equality. It was two hundred years later, and they still fought themselves about it. We were thinking about renting this place for Maizawa Sensei. Ah, oh, very good. All Might turned to direct his trademark grin at the sliding doors that led out into the backyard just as Izu had opened it. Something bizarre happened right then. They both froze staring at one another with nearly identical expressions of agonized dismay. Then All Might deflated with an explosion of steam, which Hitoshi had never seen before, and spat blood. Izuku, meanwhile, slammed the sliding door shut again. Hitoshi could hear his footsteps pounding away from them. Wait! All Might choked out between coughs. Come back! Hitoshi, go after him. Aizawa went toward All Might, only to be waved back. No, I'll, I'll follow him. Please, give us a moment. All Might spat again, wiped his mouth with a grim look, and he swelled back up to his large form before vaulting over the entire house and landing somewhere in the street out front. What the actual fuck? Hitoshi wheezed. What had just happened? Izuku had never run from anyone or anything in the whole time that they'd known each other. He ran towards things. The harder and scarier they were, the faster th he went. We're going. Aizawa echoed his own thoughts. In fact, they were both moving already. Legs engaged long before the either of them ever had brains catching up. All Might had caught Izuku almost at the corner, which was impressive, even considering how fast he normally was. 
All Might had a hand on his shoulder, and Hitoshi was about to put an extra burst of speed in when... when... when All Might bowed. He did it deeply, from the waist, arms straight out at his side, and it was the most Japanese mannerism he'd ever seen from the retired hero. There was a lot of nuances of apologies in Japanese, and immigrants didn't always grasp them. Americans especially had one phrase for sorry, and relied on context or tone to convey just how sorry they were. Then there were the words he chose. They could hear all might even from half a block away. I'm so sorry. Foreigners usually stuck with Gomen Nasai. It was reliable, albeit slightly of an informal apology. For the first time, Atoshi wondered if All Might really was an American. Musutafu was an oddly specific place to retire to. He'd always thought All Might had returned to be around his alma mater, but maybe. Aizawa put a hand on Atoshi's shoulder to stop him. It wasn't really necessary. Hitoshi could see already that All Might and Izuku somehow had a history, and some ghosts they needed to lay to rest as well. They talked for a little while. It was hard to stay put when Izuku started tearing up, but he reached into his pocket before Hitoshi could do anything and pulled out his license of all things. All Might took it and slowly started laughing. It wasn't his usual boom. It was a quiet, wry sound. Okay, that was enough. The aging hero handed Izuku's license back to him as they approached and bowed again. Thank you for sharing this with me, he said as they got to earshot. I've never been happier to be proven wrong. I I would still like to discuss that other matter more later, if you're willing, at least. Izuku hemmed and hawed and blushed. I, I'm going to have to talk to my partner first. We're a team. All Might winced. I'd prefer you don't share anything we talked about with Red Tower, please. That got a startled blink out of Izuku. Oh, no. I, I meant Hitoshi. He waved a hand in front of his face. Ah, Aizawa and young Shinso. All might notice that they had an audience, and at that point it started to back off like they were a pair of wild dogs. I, uh, should probably get going. We can set up a time to take me out of the security system, right? Right. And then he took off before any of them could stop him, and Izuku just stood there staring at his phone. I have All Might's private cell phone number, he wheezed. Hitoshi tried on and discarded several replies to that. He was getting good at biting his tongue working at Watchtower. He settled on, That's great, Izu. Do you still want to look at the house? Yes, please, Izuku replied in the tiniest voice imaginable. Okay, so you can't be mad. Kid, if you say that, it's like a guarantee that I'm going to get pissed off beyond recognition. I saw you-know-who today. Where? Did he talk to you? He talked to you. It's okay. He, uh, apologized, actually. For, you know, that. It's a start, I guess. Still gonna bust his teeth in now that I probably can. You probably can't. He can still puff up into muscles. Shit. Okay. How the fuck did you run into abs for brains? Usually we see him coming a mile away. Also, weren't you at a racer's today? Yeah, about that. So help me if you went on a mission without anyone or on standby, I will lose my shit. No, Cat Dad actually hooked BF up with a rental, bought it cheap from one of his co-workers who was renting. Ah, oh, hell. You're ahead of me. All Might forgot to take himself out of the security system and got an alert that someone was in the house. We ran into each other there. I'm surprised that he recognized me, actually. It really wasn't a big deal when we met. Kid, no. Here's the thing. You're going to remember every heart you break. It'll happen eventually. Maybe you fumble a save more. Likely you'll uncover somebody or something they wish they'd never had to find out about. If you're a hero worth a damn, it's going to stick with you. And that was a big deal, okay? Maybe if you remember it differently, but you were hanging on by a thread back then, kiddo. Getting stepped on by just about everybody in your life except your mom. Anybody who bothered to look could see it. I was scared out of my mind and didn't know what to do or how to help. No one can keep getting back up forever. You wore your heart all over your face back then. There was no way that he didn't know that you were asking him to just throw you a lifeline. Maybe he thought that no hope was better than false hope. I don't pretend to know what it's like being the number one, but I do know that I'd have lost sleep for years afterwards if I've done to somebody what he did to you, even if I thought I was doing the right thing. So yeah, he remembered you. They didn't go back to Mike and Aizawa's place, which Aizawa had not liked at all. 
The train ride had been silent. They had sat side by side, holding hands while Izu had texted, unhappily with Tower. Hitoshi wanted to know what All Might had asked Izuku about, but didn't trust himself not to ask if they started talking before they were in private. Somehow, Izu's one-room mansion was even tinier and shabbier than he remembered once he had their new, fresh place in his memory. Even Izu let out a wry laugh. At least I won't have much to pack. He herded Hitoshi over to the bed and crawled right in after him. They lay there quietly for a while until Izuku had found his words. So that was really... something. The house or All Might? Hitoshi was kind of stuck between two extremes of amazement. The fact that the perfect house had been dropped in their laps and whatever the hell had been going on with All Might. I heard him apologize to you, but not what about. Oh, that... Izuku's ears went red with embarrassment. I, uh, we met when I was in middle school. I was attacked by this really gross mutant villain, and All Might was the responding hero, and I was going through this phase where I thought I could just get one person to, to validate me, I guess. Then maybe my dreams weren't so hopeless, so afterwards I asked All Might if he thought that someone without a quirk could become a hero. Judging by the intensity of that apology, Atoshi didn't guess the answer had been yes. He said no. Izuku sighed. He said no. I actually saw him run out his timer and go small might, so I knew that he wasn't telling me no because he was prejudiced. He'd been hiding that injury for years. He told me, some random kid, the whole thing, so he must have needed to get it out. I've been sitting on that secret for years. Seeing the Kamino ward fight was much more terrifying, knowing what I knew. So your reaction to that was to go out and become a hero anyway, the first quirkless pro-hero? Hitoshi flipped them over so Izuku was on his back. Then he took time kissing the ever-loving shit out of his boyfriend, who'd responded to being let down gently by the greatest hero in history with the most glorious fuck-you body Hitoshi could ever imagine. I love you. He slipped the words between kisses. So damn much. He was going to have to get a ring. That was a really big realization for an 18-year-old. He'd been circling the idea for a while, but he wanted to see how they handled life without school in the way first. This, though, was a giant blinking neon sign from the universe saying, This one, dummy. Hitoshi wasn't going to do any better. Didn't even want to if he could. Izuku, though, had one more bomb for him that evening. All Might asked me if I wanted to inherit his quirk. There was a record scratch noise in Hitoshi's head. Whatever he'd been expecting, it wasn't that. Okay... Assuming it's possible, I'd say take it and run. He replied, it was so outlandish that he couldn't even reject the idea. It's not, so that was a really cruel thing to say. He didn't want to have to punch All Might and break his hand on the guy's face, but it seemed like he was going to have to do it just for that statement. Um, Izuku shook his head. It apparently is. That's one of the things he apologized to me about. He inherited his quirk from someone else. He said that... He was the eighth person to have it. Before that, he was quirkless, just like me. Wow, that was a new level of hypocrisy that even Hitoshi had not been prepared for. Seriously? Hitoshi scowled. Fuck that guy. Absolutely take his quirk, but block his number right after. You think I should? I'm not going to lose his number, but taking the quirk, I mean. Izuku tucked his face into the joint between Hitoshi's neck and his shoulder. What does that mean for everything I've done up until now? I put so much effort into becoming a hero without one. What do you have to prove, though? Hitoshi asked. You're a pro already. You have an agency, a ranked agency. At the age of 18, Yue's never graduated a quirked hero who's done that. The only thing that this would mean is that you don't need to worry about the Hero Commission taking away your license on a bigoted technicality anymore. He paused and smiled as something else occurred to him. Imagine the look on Bakugo's face the first time you Delaware smashed something in front of him. That got a snicker out of him. Imagine Hideo's face. Oh man, I can hear the profanity already. Hitoshi kissed the green curls just under his nose. So, uh, not to be bitchy, but is there anything else that you haven't been telling me? Um, Izuku's tone was incriminating. In my defense, there's a bunch of stuff that I did forget about and only remember later when it comes up. Okay, I'm going to need a promise that you'll just tell me when that happens. Hitoshi sighed and let Izuku roll them over onto his side. You just did, I can tell. Fess up. Izuku gulped. You remember how your dad stopped sending you money before? He asked. No way. 
Hitoshi sat up so that he could stare down at the boy under him. Yeah, Wei. Izuka tried for a charming smile. I only threatened him a little bit. A little bit, Hitoshi echoed. You scared my dad into reinstating my allowance and kept that from me? In my defense, it was when Aizawa had you guys doing those really sadistic urban infiltration exercises, and you were out of your mind with stress on top of not getting enough to eat. I just... I'd had enough, so I snuck into his office, waited for him to show up. I didn't touch him. We just talked. He came around to my point of view. He didn't elaborate on what his point of view was. No wonder Hitoshi's dad had been hiding in the bedroom. It might not have been entirely a ploy just to trick his mom into taking the heat if their blackmail scheme went south. He didn't scare easily, but once he did, he stayed scared. Were you using your Izuku voice or your Watchman voice? Hitoshi could guess which. He still got occasional chilling flashbacks to him saying, Are you not satisfied, Detective Ito? For no good reason, except it had been scary, but also kind of hot. I have a Watchman voice? Izuku looked scandalized. He clearly had no idea. What does it sound like? Deeper. Hitoshi thought about it as he flopped back down, landing half on Izuku who made a pleased noise. Like that teacher who knows what you did and has all day to wait for you to admit it. You switch up your diction just a little bit, so Watchman's more formal, uses bigger words. Oh, that part's on purpose. I want to keep people guessing on how old Watchman is. The costume's designed to baffle my silhouette, too. I'd picked up on that. Hitoshi had noticed that Izu was a little taller and broader in costume. Are you using lifts in your boots? Slight lifts. I still need to be able to run. The hood peeks out a little higher than my head and my shoulder armor is a little padded on top, too. Most of it's my armor, to be honest. I just expanded things here and there. Izuku paused thoughtfully. I don't know where to get furniture, and I'm not sure I want to keep anything from here. I found most of it on the curb for free in the newspaper. Oh, man, don't ask me. Hitoshi groaned. He'd been trying to avoid thinking about that part of them going from a tiny bedroom in a studio apartment into a full house. We're going to be eating off of boxes for a while. Hang on, Izuku sighed as his phone chirped and he rooted around in his back pocket. It's probably Hideo. He... He drew up short. What? Hitoshi rolled over to get a look at his boyfriend's face. Izuku had gone pale and showed Hitoshi his screen. Izuku, dear, it's your mother. Do you have time to meet up? The phone chirped again with another incoming message. The third, fourth... Oh, God. Izuku texted just like his mom. It's nothing urgent. Or bad. I'll understand if you're busy. I don't know what your work schedule's like. Just whenever you have a moment, I'd like to see you. Mayday. Hideo, help. What? The fuck is going down on a 8 p.m. on a Sunday? Mom texted me. Oh, shit. She okay? Like you wouldn't know if she wasn't. Or are we still pretending that you don't have a big sad crush on my mom? We don't talk about that. All right, fine. I haven't gotten any alerts from my AI cams, but they wouldn't know if she'd gotten sick or something. They ain't that smart. Oh, no, I didn't even think about that. Shit. What if she's dying? Fuck shit, damn. I made it worse. She wants to meet in person. Whatever it is, it isn't a phone conversation. Kid... No conversation between you two is going to be a phone conversation for a while. Where are you meeting? When? Your Banna Park in my old neighborhood tomorrow at noon. Okay, so it's outdoors and she'll have to walk a couple blocks to get there. Did she suggest it? Yeah. Good sign, then. As far as I know, nothing's happened with your dad, either. I get alerts. Maybe she just wants to bury the hatchet. It's been three years. All her friends' kids just graduated high school. That's an inciting incident right there. Maybe. Bring Sai. What, in costume? In civvies. He's bitchy enough to pull you out of things if it's ugly and you try to stay. Only you could make that sound like a compliment. One problem. He hates Mom. Hates. How can anybody hate Enko chan They haven't met. He knows what happened now, but there was a while when I couldn't talk about her without getting upset, and he had to fill in the blanks in my story himself. And you know what his parents are like. That was his basis for comparison. Fair. Take him anyways. Wouldn't hurt to have someone there whose only priority is you. I'm... I'm compromised, kid. I want you both to make up and be happy, so I might not step in even if I should. Besides, I gotta be Mama Duck, and we've gone a whole week without Ground Zero fighting somebody, or Chaco chan decking him, and I'm starting to get antsy. Either something's brewing behind the scenes, or he's keeping his head down. Not sure which possibility scares me more. Never thought fucking Endeavor's kid would be the bastion of serenity on my team, but here we are. 
I wouldn't put too much weight on that. When he goes, he goes. How would you know? Remember when we bagged Stain and there was that one student who went off on the chief of police? No. No, I would remember that. That, was, that kid was my hero. That was him. He was the reason that we had to give partial credit to Endeavor. The Burns, remember? He was a first year. I couldn't give him permission to use his quirk. You gave me blanket permission to engage when someone's life was under threat. Vocational program student heroes need permission every individual time, but he still backed me up when Manuel sent me after that baby ingenium. Holy shit, still waters do run deep. He doesn't remember me. That was still when I was running around in the green jumpsuit and before I'd settled on a name. I may have said some stuff to him about half-assing his quirk. He had this hang-up about using his fire, and I got ticked off, and I might have also punched him, so maybe don't bring it up in conversation. Kid. Hitoshi hated the park. He hated the fact that the sun had figured out that summer was on its way and subsequently beat down on his head like a hammer. He hated the fact that his shade tree was still too sparse to help much, and he especially hated Aizawa's stupid microphone because it had an incredibly narrow beam, and Aizawa had also lost the mount for it, so Itoshi had to hold the thing steady by hand, which was going to get old real fast. He regretted not going back to the agency to borrow some of their superior gear. The parabolic mics looked dumb, but he could have set up on a nearby roof with a parasol and gotten better reception. Aizawa's shotgun mic had less range, so Hitoshi was stuck hiding behind a bush and hoping that no one wandered by and asked him what he was doing. They'd gotten here a little early, and Izuku was sitting on a bench watching a duck pond, waiting for his mom to put in an appearance, and she wasn't late yet, but part of Hitoshi was waiting for the whole thing to have been some elaborate sting operation. It was dumb and paranoid, but they'd also been out of contact for three years. Hitoshi couldn't help but worry. "'I can't hear anything.' Uraraka complained over the party line that Tower had set up between their earpieces. That was the other thing Hitoshi was hating about this whole affair. It was a slow day at the agency, so Tower had asked to be patched into the audio feed, and it was only a matter of time before Uraraka, Bakugo, and even Todoroki got curious. Hitoshi was speculating about that last one. Todoroki didn't ask direct questions, but seemed to materialize any time the subject came up in conversation, no matter where he was or what he'd been doing. The ducklings, aside from Bakugo, who already knew, had taken the revelation that Watchman was a kid their age pretty well. They'd had a briefing about it the day after Izuku finally told Bakugo the truth. Of course, they'd been confused about why he hadn't just gone to school like a normal person. Tower and Izuku had decided to continue keeping Izuku's lack of a quirk secret, but fortunately the admission scandal had targeted lots of kids with undesirable or weak quirks, so they didn't have to go into a lot of details. Ura was still making Izuku buy her drinks for keeping it a secret, but kind of understood once Hitoshi had pulled her aside to explain the whole Bakugo aspect. She was mostly sad that they'd been robbed of a chance to go to school together. A lot of the other stuff had come out, including Izuku's rift with his mom and his relationship with Tower. Unfortunately, that meant that the ducklings were now really invested in getting Izuku and his mom back together. Hitoshi wasn't so sure himself. Izuku had taken off his earpiece before coming out, so he had no idea that any of this was going on, and Itoshi was seriously considering following suit. "'That's because nothing is happening,' he gritted out. "'I'm almost there with a the fucking camera,' Bakugo said, and Itoshi's day somehow got instantly worse. Who'd said anything about a camera? "'Go the fuck home, Bakugo.' Bakugo just jeered at him. "'Ah, oh, too bad, princess. I got orders from Tower. Maybe if Watchman still had his earbud in, I'd have listened to you.' Children, don't think I won't turn this operation around if you keep bickering. Tower broke in. Sigh, accept the equipment drop from Ground Zero, please. Zero, quit being a dick about it. They both made vague, affirmative noises back. For the first time in his life, though, Bakugo's appearance improved Hitoshi's day. He showed up with a good espionage gear, a better transmitter, a sunshade, an even cooler bag of chilled drinks. They relocated to the poorly secured roof on a nearby coffee shop with good sight lines. There was a light breeze up there, too, so Hitoshi felt less like he was going to die of a heat stroke. We got movement. Bakugo had the binoculars while Hitoshi finished setting up and handed them over so he could take a look. She's the lady in the pink cardigan, who looks like she might run. Hitoshi found he actually didn't need the help. Midori Inko looked exactly like her son, except softer and rounder. They had the same coloring and those same round green eyes. They also had the same awkward dance of 
Should I stay or go? She shuffled back and forth a short distance from Izuku, who surely knew that she was there and had chosen not to put her on the spot by turning to look. Aw, cute, Uraka cooed. Inko-san eventually got her courage together and went to sit down next to her son. They sat in silence for a while, staring at the ducks. I... I'm glad that we can meet up, Izuku. Inko-san was clutching her purse into her lap. Um, me too. Izuku's voice was almost too soft for the mic to actually pick up. H how have you been? I've been all right, I guess. Not much changes for me without you home. Inko-san didn't sound all that convincing. I've been worried that I'd never see you again. Katsuki Takun had told me that he saw you and your number was still the same, so I thought you'd have disconnected it when the number vanished from my bill. Itoshi shot Bakugo a look, but he was staring studiously at the camera screen. Robbed of his chance to make amends by helping Izuku become a hero, he'd apparently decided to switch up objectives, and no wonder he'd been keeping quiet at the agency. He was getting into all this trouble outside of working hours. What else did he tell you? Izuku sounded cautious. Itoshi couldn't really see the details of his expression, though through those binoculars or the camera feed. That you were doing really well for yourself, and that you were seeing someone? Inko-san replied slowly. D did you end up going to school? No, I found an apprenticeship. Izuku's tone had gone tight. There were some lean times, but my job is starting to take off now. I'm okay now. Oh, I, I see. Inko-san's head dropped. I'm sorry, Izuku. I, I shouldn't have said what I did. There's things that you don't know about that I didn't explain to you, and I did. I expected you to behave as though you did. You mean about Dad? Izuku guessed. I know about him. You, Inko-san squeaked. Y you do? H how? Mostly I figured it out, but I also met his half-brother and one of his cousins. A man and a woman, Inko-san's voice trembled, and her hands flew up to her mouth. Izuku, please don't associate with those people. They showed up at the house after your father's arrest, and they wanted to take care of us. I sent them away. I, I didn't want them leading you down that same path. She stopped and asked, horrified, Is that your job? Please, I, I don't have the right, but please. Kids, what you just heard is top secret. Tower ordered them over the party line. Forget you even heard it. If I even hear this as a rumor later, then I'm going to come for all your asses, you got it? Itoshi heard mumbled assents, echoing Bakugo's quiet agreement. He didn't look all that surprised. Then again, his parents had probably met Midori Hazashi at one point, and they would have recognized the face under the dragon's mask. Mom? Mom, hold on, just... He fumbled something, probably his phone out of his pocket. Was that the lady you saw? I... yes, Inko-san replied, confused. Her hair was longer at the time, but I recognized her face and those teeth. Yeah, this is what she looks like in costume, Izuku said as he swiped the screen on his phone. What do you mean? That's... Oh, oh! Inko-san squeaked in dismay. The rest of his family isn't like him, Izuku explained gently. They really did just want to help. Oh no, I turned the garden hose on them! His mother wailed, and the last bit of Hitoshi's grudge vanished as he fought not to laugh. Bakugo clamped both hands over his mouth and rolled over onto his back, almost crying with the effort not to let his guffaws out. Seriously, Tower? Hitoshi asked. I went back a week later and she threw a shoe at me. Cursed me out so bad I actually learned some new words. She looks like a pushover, he replied fondly. She ain't. Hitoshi couldn't hear the next bit over Bakugo's stifled laughter and leaned over to kick him in the ass. It didn't help, but Bakugo retreated a little ways away so he could get a grip on himself. I, I do have other things I want to ask about, dear, Inko-san asked as Bakugo got far enough away. I was contacted by a lawyer a little while ago. They're representing a class action lawsuit against the Musutafu Board of Education, specifically regarding children who were illegally screened out of higher education. That shut Bakugo up. It shut everyone up. Uh, oh, Izuku exhibited zero chill, and Itoshi could imagine his guilty little face in high definition. They sent me a list of all the schools that had a record of you applying to. She paused. It was more schools than you told me about, Izuku. Did they send you a letter? Izuku asked unexpectedly. I... yes. She handed him something, and there was some quiet for a bit as he read it. I don't think that we can participate in this, Izuku said after a while. He handed it back. 
I'm the whistleblower, so I've already been compensated. I sent you money for your uniforms that you had to buy for Ryleth, do you remember? I... I remember you getting it in the mail, but Izu... She touched his shoulder. You were fourteen, how? Izuka turned to look at her, and something about the set of his shoulders reminded Hitoshi of Watchmen. I was fourteen, and really angry. I didn't understand how all of that could happen to me, and I wanted to find out who was behind it all. Eventually I figured out I wasn't the only person affected. A lot of those kids didn't end up getting to go to school either. Some of them ended up hurting themselves. It took me a year and a half to get evidence. The school board ignored me when I approached them with it, so I found a reporter and convinced them that another major outlet was about to run with the story. It ended up as one of my first big cases and helped me understand what I was good at and what I wanted to do with my life. Not every villain shows up on the street firing a homemade laser gun into the air. Most of them have normal faces and normal lives. You wouldn't know them on the street if you passed by them. The worst of them think that they're doing just the right job or they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and if someone or even a lot of people get hurt, it's not really their problem. Even through the binoculars, you could see the moment the penny dropped for Inko-san. Her jaw dropped and her eyes grew wide. Suku, she swallowed. Are you a... Hitoshi couldn't tell for sure, but he was pretty sure Izuku winked at her before she threw her arms around him next, and everything after was crying and apologies and hugs. Hey, kid, not that I have a tracker on you, but if I did have a tracker, it might indicate that you and Inko-chan are on the train headed towards fucking Jada. Mom says hi, and that she's sorry about the hose thing. You shit. Do not bring her into this godforsaken slum. She wants to see the agency, and she brought cookies. What kind of cookies? Brown sugar oatmeal. You can have some if you tell me where the tracker on my mom is. It's in her purse. That weird bug-eyed pug charm on that strap that she has. Don't let the ducklings near any of my fucking cookies. That includes Sai. BF is playing possum. Says he's sick but really is getting a haircut and panicking about his wardrobe, according to Bird Dad. We're going to meet up tomorrow. Cat Dad is covering for him if I need to do any in-person snooping, so if you need me to look into anything, it'd better be something that can wait. Mom also wants to know if you got that tracker into her pug before she bought it or if you cut it open without her noticing, which you had better not because it's one of her favorites. You goddamn snitch. It fell off her purse last year. I put the tracker in it and left it in the lost and found at her office. It was small enough to inject through the fabric. Her stuffed dog is fine. She says don't do that anymore, and that she has a lot of shoes. I don't understand that part. It's okay. I dig it. Wait, now she's blushing. Why is she blushing? I can't help it if she's cute when she's taking a swing at somebody. If you guys are going to flirt, can you not make me be the middleman, please? Hitoshi met his probable future mother-in-law when Izuku brought her over to see the new house. Ostensibly, they were all there to paint the walls. In practice, he, I saw when Mike had already primed the walls the night before and pushed to finish the first coat shortly before Izuku and inko had showed up with bentos. Oh my, she said upon entry, looking at the exposed beams in the ceiling. This is nice, Izuku. The agency is doing that well. Aizawa-san had bought it as an income property, Izuku explained. We're renting from him, and he gave us a break on the deposits since Satoshi's family. Hey, Toshi, we're here. Come say hi. Hitoshi had been hiding upstairs and shamelessly eavesdropping at the top of the stairs with Mike and Aizawa. He bit down on a swear and glared at Aizawa, who made a pointed nod toward the stairwell. Wait! Mike hissed and fussed over Hitoshi's hair and then made him tuck in his t-shirt. Okay, go. Inko-san was round, as soft-looking in person as she'd appeared from a distance. He hadn't realized quite how small she was, though. Izuku only came up to his shoulder, but Izuku's mother was even slightly shorter than that next to her son. She reached out and grabbed Izu's sleeve. Izuku, he's tall, she whispered. I know, right? Izuku grinned, and somehow Itoshi had never realized that was something his boyfriend liked about him. Their height difference had always made him nervous, like Izuku might one day get tired of having to stand on something so they could actually be eye to eye. Midoriya-san, Itoshi bowed once he was downstairs. I'm happy to meet you at last. Inko-san bowed back. Her eyes looked suspiciously damp. I'm happy to meet you, too, she said. I hope we're able to get along well. I'm in your care. I don't think that'll be a problem, ma'am, Hitoshi said with complete honesty as he met Izuku's eyes over the top of her head. Do you want a tour? My dads are around here somewhere, too. 
Mizuku smiled, and Inko-san agreed happily and mouthed three words to him. Hitoshi smiled right back and knew that his heart was in his eyes. The future looked pretty bright. All right, everyone. This is the end of Paper Agency. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. This is one of my all-time favorite fics. I'm really thankful to those of you who recommended it. Such a great one. I hope you guys enjoyed it, though, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.